deep democracy, often people ask me why deep democracy? So deep democracy is the fact it's called deep democracy because it's going beyond majority democracy. Um, deep democracy was initiated in 1995 in South Africa to try and help a company overcome racism. The racial tension, as you know, was high in our country and we, even though we had gone through the changes f um, in a kind of a miraculous way from a very horrible apartheid or, um, com country to um, a new democratic dispensation, people themselves were still struggling with, with racism. So it was initiated to overcome racism. And deep democracy is a method that my late husband and I in, in, um, initiated based on Arnold Mandel's process-oriented psychology. And we took that framework and adapted it for the lay person. And we took it in order to help people understand that through decision-making, we kind of get the basis of interaction. Basically what we did was we took the decision-making processes in business and we adapted it in such a way that people could ensure that, pe that all people were involved. Um, most people in our country, the majority of people, hadn't had a voice. And for a long period of time they didn't know how to use their voice. Never mind that they weren't invited to use their voice. As a result of not being invited to use the voice, they didn't have a voice. So it was important to ensure that people were encouraged to have a voice and we adapted certain, we used certain tools which enabled people to make sure that all people were included and all people had a voice. We also, what tends to happen in most decision making processes is that the diverse views are often not heard. So in a typical kind of meeting, or a typical kind of business meeting, people want the yes, they want to go along with the view. And those one or two people in the minority position are often kind of um, ignored. In the larger scheme of things, in more of community processes, obviously that becomes more prevalent and that the numbers grow. But deep democracy is looking at ensuring that the minority voice is heard, that the diverse opinions are encouraged. In fact, we actually encourage people to hunt for them, to look for those minority voices, recognizing that if they're not heard, then they will become part of the resistance or what we call terrorist line. They will upset the decision or they'll sabotage the decision once it is made. Mm. After having a debate, we're ensuring that all the voices are heard and that diverse opinions are taken into account. We encourage people to take a vote. And most, where majority democracy usually ends at the vote. The majority win and the minority have to be very adult about it and go along with the vote. Well. It's based on the view that as human beings we're quite adult and it tends to negate the fact that as human beings we're quite passionate. And when we're passionate we tend not to be adult, we tend to fight for our rights. So deep democracy goes beyond majority democracy and it acknowledges that the minority would be hurt by having lost the vote and that they again, if they're not taken care of or accounted for in any way, they will become saboteurs of the decision. So deep democracy teaches to go beyond the vote to check with the minority what they need to come with, to first of all acknowledge that they've lost the vote, to give them a sense of um, that it's a sense of sympathy for having lost, and then finding out what they need to come with the vote. It's not that they're asked what they, that they'll go and get their way. So this is not where uh, you basically find um, the minority overrules the majority. It's not that process at all. It's rather what, we, that what it will take for them to come with the vote for this period of time. And as a result, with the added wisdom of what it will take to come with the, res with the vote, we get a much more robust decision. Inevitably, decisions are not linear, rational decisions. Even though business tries to be linear and rational, it's m emotional, like everything in human society. It's emotionally driven and inevitably there's going to be tensions and conflicts and deep democracy helps people recognize when those conflicts exist to recognize the beginnings of them and then to switch from the rational tool process of decision making to those processes which allow the conflict resolution to take place unlike traditional forms of conflict resolution which tries to gain consensus deep democracy which is by the way very a um, uh, atypical, will tend to encourage people to have their say 
and to actually have their say loudly and clearly. So it encourages their viewpoints of both sides to come out as much as possible. One side hearing the other side and ensuring that the listening takes place, but not dampening their viewpoint. Once they've gone through the process of stating fully their say and being heard, both sides, then they will uncover that there's some form of wisdom that's been stated, the projection that's been stated. That we call indeed democracy as taking the grain of truth. And when we collect the grains of truth, we then find that we move beyond the conflict and we move to resolution. And the re resolution is not only adding to the resolution of the conflict and attention, but it gives some greater wisdom to the whole process that's been that their people are going through. So do you get better decisions as a result of this process? Far better decisions. Mm. And not only far better decisions, but you get greater buy-in. So the time that people tend to take when decisions are made for them, so for example, if I tell you what to do, and automatically you feel the resistance, and by the way, two-year-olds feel the resistance, never mind supposed adults like ourselves. Um, from the moment you you include it in the decision-making process instead of being told what to do, you have a sense that people buy into the process. Mm -hmm. So the typical traditional um, decision-making processes which don't encourage participation, which don't encourage diverse opinions to come out, of, although they may be quicker and look more efficient, in actual fact they take longer to implement. Mm -hmm. So, although deep democracy initially takes an investment of time, it's a very efficient and effective process. Yeah. So how do you build the trust to enable that listening to take place, particularly in a situation where there's been huge mistrust before? Sure. By first of all acknowledging that the mistrust is there. So the, the method of deep democracy, we talk about it as lowering the waterline, which basically means allowing that more unconscious emotional processes to be stated. Most methodologies try and brush over those or try and suppress them. Again, totally um, a, it, in, a, in a total different way, we tend to encourage those voices. We make it safe for people to say the unsafe things. We create a safety by first of all creating safety rules. First of all, enabling people to acknowledge that that's where we're going. Um, another thing about deep democracy, it doesn't push the process. It rather gently allows people to get to the process when they're ready, by allowing what's there and present to be consciously recognized by all that are involved. And it's a form of facilitation where basically people are, um, where the safety net is created, where they feel safe to say these difficult things, and when they're encouraged to, by not being alone in it, so there's also a recognition that if one thing is said by somebody, it's actually alive and well in other people too. So we don't have people sitting down and one person saying something. We actually facilitate group discussions where people move around. And as a result, in a group, find it comfortable to say things. First of all, in that initial, um, the initial um, situation which I described in South Africa, um, over a three-year process, we were able to move this organization of five and a half thousand people who were really where the racism was tangible to a company which worked and where racism had not disappeared totally, but their people were able to work alongside with one another in a much more, in a much more equitable way. Um, and deep democracy has spread throughout the world and I think that in itself shows that it works. It's now been taught in over 20 different countries, and it's been used from boardroom to classroom, from people in the business world, and about 50 to 60 percent of it is still being worked, worked at, used in the business world, from leaders, team members, um, um, human resource people, technical people, IT people, through to um, communities and societies, and through to, to schools. So it's been done from the boardroom to the classroom, mm. where children in the schools are being taught. This is a way of communicating and dialogue, enabling them to learn different tools to the ones that they're being exposed to in, in home, which often in South Africa, where the majority of children are only exposed to violence. So this is an alternative. 
Um, it's also being used in community projects like in the First Nations people in Canada where they're trying to resolve um, urban planning. Um, given the past history of what's happened, people are suspicious of organisations and government organisations. Deep Democracy hel is helping to heal those past tensions and allow the future to take place. In Kenya, where there's conflict raging, particularly pre the, new, the next elections, uh, it's being used very successfully and in the areas where it's being used um, in the northern parts of Kenya where it's being used we've noticed that where most places there's lots of violence and lots of people being killed in the areas where deep democracy is being used we find very little violence and people are beginning to negotiate ethnic groups are actually beginning to form business relationships with one another as opposed to killing one another and then right through to um, Aboriginal Aboriginals in Australia, there's Aboriginal people again, another f kind of um, outcome of the racist policies of the country, where Aboriginals are, are questioning whether their children should go through the education system, and they often don't send their children to school. So when the children do come to school, they find it hard to settle into the Western way of functioning, and as a result of pretty disruptive during um, break time. A, a school principal in Darwin um, has used the method of um, helping children gain an understanding of how to resolve conflict between them. So five and six year olds are using it during the chill out time and as a result resolving tension. So it's being used in all kinds of situations. So I think that the big thing is that um, it's that deep democracy is a tool, a method that people use alongside whatever else they're doing. It's not a panacea for everything, and it's not something to replace either your traditional management style or traditional forms of facilitation. It's an add-on. And the beauty about the tools is that they can be used in bits and pieces. You can use a bit of the tools to help you. So, for example, in your own home, helping you have a discussion with your wife about should you go to the in-laws or not and being able to voice your negative feelings through to major areas where there's conflict being taken place so and where there's real um, real uh, tension through community strife or war, war stricken areas so it's the kind of thing that you can use when you want to use it and how you want to use it any human any person in any situation in their family through to large-scale conflict.